Homelander is known throughout the series for his temper, sadism, and ruthless behavior. However, what if there was more to him than meets the eye? What if Homelander is no longer the same villain everyone thinks he is? What if his body was taken over by a soul from Earth right before the start of Season 3? How will he change the world of superheroes with his future knowledge and Homelander's invincible strength? Listen to find out. What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei back with a new what if series, The Boys. Reborn as the Homelander. Part 1. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. The glaring horn of the semi-trailer truck penetrated the curtain of rain blanketing the city, pinging my brain to stop and turn into its Optimus Prime-sized headlights. Gucking and kept yawn bams my brain slurred as my eyes closed embracing the enveloping light as the inevitable happened. My eyes open with a gasp and consciousness flows back as cool air enters my lungs. A dream. It was all a dream. Immediately a ringing sensation hits my ears, and a splitting headache assaults the back of my head. I briefly try to look around not recognizing where I am. Whose place did I crash at? A cacophony of sounds suddenly attack me, and the ringing sensation intensifies muting them as if behind a thick wall. My whole head is now burning and my face feels flushed with heat. I stand off the couch and feel the cold floor underneath my feet. Looking down I realize I'm naked. My brain now feels like it's going to explode, and my whole body feels warm. I feel parched. Water need cold water I move towards the giant sink on the even more enormous island, only to find my limbs uncoordinated. I turn the tap on and don't even bother with finding a cup, instead I use my hands and greedily direct the flow of water into my mouth. The refreshing feeling cools down my insides, and I slowly feel the ringing tone down. Fucking inception bombs always terrible the next day. I throw my whole face in the jet and let it cool my head. The headache is slowly receding away. Huh maybe it won't be so bad today. My stomach feels fine now that I think about it. I didn't even take Pepto before going out last night. As the last remnants of the headache disappear I turn the jet off and stand wiping the water in my eyes with my hands. It's as I do the typical shaking the water out of my hands into the sink I notice something off in the spotless polished surface of the tap. What the fuck? I feel my heart rate rise up again as I take my eyes off the tap and look around again taking in every detail of the spacious living room in front of me. I see full-length mirror on the opposite side of the apartment closer to the giant windows. I practically leap there only to fall unseemingly into the couch. What the fuck is going on? I feel panic surging through my stomach to condense into a knot of anxiety as I rise. My body is disproportioned, and I just jumped from basically standing position across the large spacious living room, an impossible length. As I face the mirror I freeze. A sculpted body as if I was a swimmer, blonde hair, sharp deep blue eyes, ski sloped nose, square of jaw with a pointed chin and a face that while not mine I recognize well enough. Holy crap I'm Anthony Starr. My first thought is then the memories hit me like a bulldozer bringing back the migraine in full force. I clutch my head as I drop to the floor gasping for breath with teary eyes as the ringing intensifies and I feel as if the back of my head will explode. Images of men in white coats prodding and poking, being tied up on a tables while they tried to dissect me. Feeling the pressure of the scalpels unable to break my skin, getting angry and feeling pressure in my eyes. Being shot at with increasingly larger weapons, feeling the pain of the bullets hitting, then explosions, being drowned, lasers trying to burn me, poison burning my insides. Pain so much pain. Push harder. Faster. I hear the stern voice of the man. An unknown tendril of consciousness pings him as father. First running then flying. Tests upon tests, experiments upon experiment, and the memories progressed with images of gentle-faced women sprinkled in between, women that cared for me, argued for me, and loved me. Women that I always hurt had accidents that broke them and even killed. As the memories progressed so did my life, first a boy next a teenager and then a young man. 
My power grew, sprouting as I did in height through puberty, thickened and shaped as my jaw squared. As my life progressed the one constant were the men in white coats, the experiments continued, but the pain had subsided long ago as I grew up. The pain being replaced by a need to be acknowledged, admired to be loved. The memories continued, my introduction as a new hero, the crowd their eyes, their hopes their dreams I could see it all. My first rescue, the gratification, the cheers and adulation, basking in the glory. Streams of images of my life as hero, galas, awards, helping people the glory of it all. Then the streams thickened, darkened, my first kill, intentional. He didn't deserve to live not after what he did to those children. I felt fury, burning fury so I unleashed it. A split second is all it took, and then panic. Nothing was left of the villain. Panic. Trouble. I would be in trouble, but Madeline she made it right. She took care of it, the first, the second and the next. There was always a next in the streams of memories, it was easier and easier, less guilt, less caring, more anger. How dared they go against me? How dare they? I am faster, stronger, better. The rage I felt burning each time, villains, citizens, crowds they would all learn. But Madeline was always there to calm me down, to love me, oh how I loved you and missed you, always there until she betrayed me. A tornado of rage, loneliness, feelings, memories and emotions as if I was experiencing it for the first time. They continued to pour into my mind, and after what felt as if an eon had passed the stream slowed and emotions subdued. The ringing dimmed and the pressure released. I shakily stood, body burning with heat and dripping in sweat, as if I'd just been baptized in the fiery waters of hell. I looked in the mirror pausing, catching my breath, absorbing the revelations. I stood still, quiet one moment then two then, with but a mere thought, I will the mass of my body to gently lift up until I'm supported only by my tippy toes. I stay there for a split second, and then in an act defying the natural laws of the world, my perfect toes break contact to the ground, while I remain in the air suspended as a human-shaped chandelier. Fuck me I'm the homelander. I looked at myself in the costume and couldn't help but feel a twinge of pride. I looked good, I looked very fucking good. Unlike the real life actor this homelander could actually fill up the suit with his physique, no need to the obvious padding used in the show, though I had to admit the suit was also designed in a way to better accentuate the muscles groups. Okay so maybe there was a little bit of padding in all the right places to make everything pop out more, but whatever it still looked good. I did a bunch of tests to see if I was dreaming, pinching myself with full strength did absolutely nothing, I accepted my situation and went about to test my powers. Fuck year flying. Flying was super fun, it's really hard to explain how it feels. It's not like free falling and it's not like you feel as if you are light as a feather. It's almost like I'm able to flex an invisible muscle and will myself to move through 3D space. One moment I'm on the ground the next I'm up on the ceiling. You learn to walk when you are young, then you just do it instinctually, that's how it feels. It is instinct. That's really how it was with all the powers, they were instinctual. For super speed I simply willed myself to move faster and it happened. For laser vision I looked at something and thought about burning it, then I felt the energy pool from my stomach to my head, and I released it through my eyes. It was that way for all my powers, I thought it and it happened. The reason for that must be because I have all of Homelander's memories. It is also probably why my heightened senses are not simply assaulting me right now. The instinct to keep them at bay was probably burned in his body since he was young. I don't know why I'm here or what happened to Homelander. He was still there in my head kind of. It felt like he was a muted part of my subconscious. I felt his needs, emotions, his urges, his pride maybe it was an echo of his memories, I don't know what it meant, but I was sure I was still me. And that was actually a big fucking problem. Yes it's every little boy's dream to become a hero like Superman, have cool powers, save the day and get a second chance at life. Except I didn't become Superman, nor Batman or the Flash I became the Homelander. And I wasn't the fucking Homelander. I was still me. I was a 36 year old tech bro, okay a bit old for a bro, working as an analytics director at a crypto startup that may or may not have been dabbling in some NFT schemes, but that isn't the point. Before that I had spent my 20s climbing the corporate ladder in telecom and banking. 
I had been a workaholic who got dumped by his long-term girlfriend at 31, then four months later lost my job at BOA due to a restructuring. I then spent a year traveling the country and finding myself like the millennial that I was and realized I wasted my 20s working hard and not enjoying life. I had been more in love with the life I thought I wanted than what was actually in front of me. It ruined my relationship and it wasted my youth. This realization was followed by the next four years of partying and jumping from startup to startup trying my hand in the tech world, which brings me here. Late night partying, blow and inception bombs combined with being way too old for a full weekend of binging, brought me to death's door. And now I'm the homelander, except I'm not. I'm many things, but I'm not a narcissistic psychotic murderer, even though I have his echo in my head his head. So no problem, just don't be a narcissistic psychotic murderer, right? Not murdering people should be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Normally yes, except if these memories are right then I just landed in this body during season 3 of The Boys. That means that somewhere out there is the dreaded plane video, the bane of my existence. The boys are out there trying to find Soldier Boy, or maybe they already found him and he is coming back to the States, and also I had a son somewhere hidden from me. Just at the mere thought of Ryan I feel a surge of emotion and an overwhelming compelling feeling to find him. He's my son. Fucking echo. Yes, I feel Homelander's true emotions on the matter. Possessiveness, conflict, pride, even love for Ryan. Or at least love for the idea of Ryan and a family. I sighed, all issues that needed to be taken care of otherwise I would never be able to enjoy my new life. Complicated issues, especially the plain problem I did not want to become an outcast in this new world. My power won't matter for much if the people are going to be against me. Still there was hope, ideas were popping in my mind on how to deal with each of them. I had power, popular support and part of the media on my side. I will find a way. I won't waste time like I did before. Not with this amazing chance at a new life. I will crush them all if I need to. I thought as I stood straighter in the mirror. One by one I will take them on. But for now I have a board meeting to attend. I know these are difficult times, but with the greatest humility, I accept your nomination as CEO of Vought International. I heard Ashley say. Controlled super hearing was fantastic, I could hear everything that was happening not only in Vought Tower, but for miles on end if I wanted to. For now I was mostly focused on the meeting behind the double wide doors and waiting for my cue. You know, my mother used to say, before she died of cancer when I was 17, the room went silent the moment they heard the doors open. My apologies I hope I'm not interrupting. I said and looked at Ashley as she was frozen mid-speech. No, of course not sir. Ashley immediately says. I pause and look at her for a tenses moment, then smile. Ashley please, enough with the sir stuff. How many times do I have to tell you, call me John? She looked at me with big white eyes, stumped. Uh, yes sir, John the first mean. She finally blurted out. Thank you. Now, hello everyone. I said to the room of directors. Sorry I'm late. Got stuck ironing my cape, for all my strength unfortunately I wasn't able to defeat the dreaded wrinkle. I said with a wink and sat down. The laugh to be polite, so I had terrible jokes, sue me. Okay, so seeing as it's my first board meeting, I thought perhaps we'd start by, uh, going around the room and giving you all a chance to introduce yourselves. Bill Marsh. Said the bald past middle-aged man two seats down on my left next to Ashley. And I, for one, would like to thank you, Homelander, for giving me the opportunity to serve this board at such a pivotal moment in, uh, Vought's history. Pat Willis, sir. Said a chubby fellow on my right with a full head of graying hair. You've rid us of Stan Edgar and restored honesty, integrity and innovation to this corporation. He finished. One questions. The lady next to him said. With the changes around here, our a bit the margins will drop a tiny bit. How do you want to handle that on the earnings call? I instantly felt irritation surging through me, and I clenched my jaw in reflex. I did not like being challenged and put on the spot, asking questions in a tone as if I didn't know what I was doing. Crush her head. Okay, calm the fuck down Echo. I pushed back the surge of emotions and took control. This was going to be a pivotal moment. I was now in charge of Vought as chairman of the board. What I do now would set up the tone for the company. What's your name? 
I asked through gritted teeth on blinking. Maureen I held the silence and the stare for a tense two moments. Then I broke out into a cold smile. Maureen I repeated slowly I am glad you asked that question. I said while standing from my sit walked slowly around the room in her direction. I was first going to wait until everyone was done their introductions, but we might as well address this issue now. I stopped for a brief moment right behind her seat, I could feel her stiffen up. I let the tension build for a moment. I wanted her to know she fucked up by not letting everyone get their introductions in. From this moment on Vought will not be posting any profits. I said and slowly continued my counterclockwise walk around the table. Nobody knew what to say. Eventually Maureen's courage came back. I'm sorry sir. What do you mean Vought will not post any profits? Maureen, please call me John. I have had enough with the sir crap. Okay? I said looking at her she nodded. From this moment forward every single penny Vought makes will either be reinvested back into the business, in our employees, R&D or in new ventures. Profits will be a thing of the past. I continued as I reached back to Ashley's seat. They all looked around the room like I said I was crazy, even Ashley. John, I don't think our shareholders will appreciate it. I asked cutting Maureen off. You are right they won't. That's why we need to give them something else to focus on we need to give them something bigger to look forward. I said turning towards the window, looking out at the expanse of New York City. You see Frederick Vaught started this company as an R&D lab with the purpose to change people into something better. I said accentuating the word. That eventually turned the lab into a superhero company, for better or for worse. Stan Edgar, for all his business acumen, only saw the worst that heroes had to offer and tried to steer the company back into its pharmaceutical roots, thinking that was the intended vision of course he was wrong. I was laying it on thick now. Vaught has always been about making people better so it's that root, that idea which we need to re-embrace. We need to be better. We have to make people better to make humanity greater. Vought will be the company that guides the next step in human evolution, I said turning around suddenly. Not only on an individual and personal level, but on for society as a whole. I said with fire in my tone. I could feel all of them watching me with white eyes filled with trepidations for my own gaze, must have looked manic to them. Vought will be humanity's guiding light in the dreadful dark. I raised my hand palm open and closed it into a fist. Vought will be hope. I finished loudly. They all just looked at me tense unsure what to say, and I could tell a little bit scared. And, and Maureen stuttered. How exactly are we going to do that? Quite simple my dear I relaxed my pose and brought both hands behind my back. Vought is going into space. Space? Ashley asked. Well it's more like she blurted it out. She's been trained not to question me so I saw her jerking reaction when she realized what she did. I only smiled at her and looked around the room. The directors were all looking at me incredulously. I have half a mind to think they would actually prefer psychotic Homelander with no business answers, instead of crazy space idea Homelander. Yes, space. I confirmed calmly. Vought has all the basic ingredients to turn humanity into a multi-planetary species. It is the next step in the evolution of our society. We will be at the forefront for it. I continued while sitting back in my chair. Of course that will be the overarching mission of the company. There are many steps in between. I leaned back in my chair getting more comfortable. First we will start with something small and reasonable such as telecom. We will launch satellites into space and provide internet and phone service at a reasonable price to millions of underserved rural Americans. But we don't have any aerospace experience or telecom, not on that scale at least. Bill Marsh said. And launching things into orbit is expensive, very expensive. He said surely. You are right of course. I confirmed. We don't have that experience so we will either have to partner up with or acquire companies in the industry. However what we do have is an advantage that no other company has in the world. I paused and looked around the table to see if any of them will jump at an answer. They didn't. Me. I stated firmly. They looked at me waiting to elaborate so I did. While our greatest minds will be working diligently on reusable rockets, cheaper fuel and better engines, I can fly the satellites into orbit myself. I usually fly up there regularly to get some peace and quiet. You have no idea how noisy things get when you have super hearing. 
I knew from his memories that Homelander did periodically fly into orbit to admire the Earth. He liked how small it looked. It made him feel big like he could crush it if he wanted to. By my estimation I should be able to fly anywhere between 1 and 10 tons, depending on sturdiness of the structure I'm flying. I'll leave that to the brain Iacs to figure out. That should be between one third and half the cost of satellites. That seemed to open their eyes, and I swear I saw the gears turn in their brains. I'm not naive. I said. I know advancing humanity's space footprint and making our species multiplanetary will take a ridiculous amount of money. And I am not against making profits if that's what you are worried. The profits will simply be reinvested into something greater. Think of the resources out there for the taking through asteroid or moon mining. Think of the new technologies the research will bring. I pause to let their imagination run. The telecom venture will be our proof of concept. I'm sure at least the US government will want to get in on the action. I said slyly. They love putting things into space. Especially if they can block China by having an exclusive contract with us. From there we'll expand and expand and expand. I finished firmly. I looked at them and I saw them smile. I knew I had them. An outrageous idea suddenly became possible. The sharks were smelling blood in the water and wanted their share. The meeting lasted for another two hours as we discussed my half-assed plan of bringing glory to humankind and how we would approach the announcement on the earnings calls. As they were leaving I asked Ashley to stay. Yes John, she asked apprehensively. She wasn't sure if I was just putting up a show for the directors. She was testing the waters. Yes Ashley, I am serious about calling me John, and I am serious about everything I have said today. You and me I said getting close to her that she could feel my breath on her forehead. Her heart was thumping loud and clear. She was scared but to her credit she only barely trembled. We are going to lead Vaud into a new and glorious era. I took a lock of her hair, felt it between my fingertips, I wasn't wearing the red gloves, I felt they were too bulky for normal use. I pushed the lock back behind her ear. And I am just as serious when I say that you need to take better care of yourself and your hair. I continued and stepped away from her. You seem to be missing a bunch of clumps. Now, can you do me a favor and find the deep and bring him here? He might have misinterpreted my words, and so I feel like he's about to do something very stupid, and I need the both of you here to clear it up. Ye dot dot s, yes her voice trembled and she rushed out the door. The moment the door closed I could hear her breaths of relief. I had to admit part of me was enjoying seeing her squirm beneath my gaze. It took about 10 minutes for Ashley to bring him up, and unsurprisingly, he was accompanied by his wife Cassandra. You wanted to see me sir? He asked, with a hopeful voice. Yes I did deep. I paused to look at him and then at his wife. She was hot by my standards. Pink lingerie, perky tits, I let my eyes roam over all of her body. Rip her clothes off, cuck him. My right eye twitched at the stray thought. Fucking echo. I could see that she was a bit unnerved, but the deep didn't dare say anything. Not only he was scared of me, but I practically smelled his desire to be back in my good graces, back in the spotlight. I turned back to him. I couldn't help but overhear your meeting in crime analytics earlier today, and I think you may have misinterpreted my intentions in the conversation we had yesterday. I told him. Oh okay he looked at me confused and so did his wife. You don't want me to take control to clean house of dissenters? He continued unsure. Poor choice of words on my part. I stated. What my intention was to ensure we have a clean house. One that works efficiently, in harmony. The folks using social media to express their grievances against Vought, against me well they are not in harmony with the rest of the team, but they are still part of the team. I paused. And crime analytics is a very, very important team. It's how we maintain our image, by solving and preventing crime. A hero cannot be a hero if he doesn't tackle crime. Isn't that right? Yes, of course. He replied. Well said sir. Ashley replied. My head snapped towards her, and she immediately fixed her mistake. John, I mean John. I turned back to the deep. So you see we need to keep the team happy, so they can work effectively like little bees. It's why I've made you head of crime analytics, nominally, Barbara will still be in charge of the actual day-to-day -day operations of course. Then I laughed, snorted more like and stole a look at Ashley. You obviously don't have an analytical bone in your body. 
Ashley joined in the laughter and so did his wife. I could hear they were both genuine in their laughter. Making fun of the deep felt pretty good, but I turned back serious and continued. So you see what I want you to do is to go there and inspire them, be their shining light, become their friend. As your first assignment I want you to get to know everyone, find out how they take their coffee, their hobbies, the names of their pets. He looked at me confused. Endear yourself to them, become their trusted ear, their connection to the seven. Make them feel like they are part of the team. You are the only one that can do it. I I am? Of course. The rest of the team they are prickly well they are a bunch of assholes really. I stated. You on the other hand, are approachable, friendly, a real man of the people. Your telepathy grants you something that the rest simply don't have. Oof. Man I was going to need to rinse my mouth after spewing this much bullshit. That does. His eyes were big, questioning and absorbing everything I said. I moved close to him and did the classic Homelander move where I put my right hand behind his head and slightly pulled him in. Empathy, deep, empathy. You can connect with the common man. So can you do this for us Kevin? I used his real name for added effect. For the team? For me? And I looked him straight in the eyes. Why, excellent. I let him go and turned back towards Ashley. Now to fix the earlier miscommunication, we'll bring Barb back on board, and then you and her are going to conduct performance reviews, and you are going to ensure that everyone gets a bonus increase between 20 and 30 percent. Understood? I asked the room and everyone agreed. It took another hour to find Barbara and get her back on board. All it cost was some heartfelt apologies plus a 50 percent raise in comp and 50% retention bonus of total comp. Fuck it bot had money. I could have just fired the deep or called him a moron, but that would be counterproductive. The deep was an idiot, but he was very malleable. He would become my loyal idiot. I did not plan on isolating myself like Homelander did in the show. One mana kingdom does not make. Plus I had too many enemies. The boys were gunning for me, and so was the government well parts of the government. Soldier Boy was going to make an appearance today as well. I needed allies, loyal soldiers who would do my bidding because they believed in me and my cause, but mostly because they believed in me. I'm not stupid I know the deep can be wishy-washy, but I also know that deep down, pun intended, he wants to do the right thing. He yearns for respect, for acknowledgement and even to repent for his previous crimes. With the right pressure points, a sprinkle of fear and a bit of respect, he can be a most loyal tool. A dumb tool but loyal. After all I don't want all my soldiers to be smart. Too smart and they start asking too many questions. The next of my potential allies are A-Train and Black Noir. A-Train knows too much, so he either needs to be brought back into the fold or eliminated. I didn't want to eliminate A-Train because he could be very useful. He was still popular and having a speedster on the team was always a good idea. Plus I wanted to minimize deaths. It is a goddamn testament to Edgar, Stillwell and Ashley's skills, bought as a whole really that they have been able to cover up so much crap. A-Train can be convinced back in his motivations mirrored the deep thought he is not nearly as malleable. Black Noir was of the one and the most needed one. He was by far the most capable in his abilities both in his heroics and clandestine actions. The man was a trained ninja, stoic, silent and deadly, and he had ridiculous high ratings. When you don't say a word, people just project their own image onto you. I know this isn't like the comics so I have nothing to fear there, but the question is if he is Edgar's man or not. Even so his feelings on Soldier Boy were clear enough. If I give him Soldier Boy that should earn his loyalty for a time at least. Provided I can actually take down Soldier Boy, considering how though he is I might have to chuck him into a star or something which isn't a bad idea now that I think about it. A problem for later. For now I need to deal with my first meeting of the seven what's left of them. I watched leaning back comfortably in my chair as the team filled the room. And when I say watched I do mean watched mostly Meeve and Starlight. Supervision was great, fantastic for a pervert, and Homelander was a pervert, good thing I was kind of as well. Of course I'm going to peek, what kind of red-blooded American man wouldn't peek? Even though I had memories of me and Meeve doing it, I was still enjoying the view. She was well endowed, with firm round breast and a very toned body. Each supple curve of her physique brought memories to the front where we were joined as one. 
A cocktail of conflicting emotions surged in my chest. My eyes wandered too below the belt and hot damn, I mean I shouldn't have been surprised, but hey it's technically my first time seeing it. The carpet matched the fiery drapes, but she definitely needed to do some trimming. Muff dive her. Can't argue with that one echo, I really want to. Too bad she fucking hates my guts another issue to work on. Meve was powerful and popular especially in the LGBT plus ally sector. As a longtime member of the Seven she gave credibility to any issue we tackled. I'm not going to pretend I can make her an ally, but at the very least I needed to neutralize her one way or another. There was another benefit to keeping Meve around that Homelander had pointed out. She was by far the strongest female soup. She was stronger and more durable than most of the male soups as well. Her DNA was precious, her eggs were valuable. Even if we didn't produce a child they were still gold research material. Homelander wasn't stupid per se. I had his memories and he had read up the research materials on compound V ok the short notes. The compound reacted differently for every person, hence the different powers and the incredibly high mortality rate especially in adults. It was obviously something in the DNA some sort of mutant or metahuman genes that the scientists haven't been able to fully identify and refine the formula V to properly interact with them. But they must be getting close otherwise Stan Edgar wouldn't have put his hopes on 24 volt. So if it's in the DNA then that means it's hereditary, which means offspring of soups will more likely be able to adapt to having V in their system. So Meve was valuable, not only for me but for mankind but also because I really wanted to dive in that muff again. I turned my gaze back to Annie who was just about to sit next to me, she was co-captain after all. I couldn't help feel displeased yet horny. Bend that bitch over. I already felt the blood rush downstairs. Fucking echo or was that me I had a thing for tiny blondes. She was slimmer in figure than Meve with smaller but perkier tits. Body toned as well with pink strawberry lips both sets, trim too. Now that I think about it everyone looks slightly better than they looked in the show, less wrinkles more tone more vibrant. I can't tell if this is because of the V or my enhanced senses it's probably the V, thank you all for coming. I stood as everyone settled in. Today is not only the beginning of a new vault, but also of a new seven. Earlier today I had a very productive board meeting where we settled on the new direction the company will be taking. I said enthusiastically. I could tell not only from their expressions but from their heartbeats that they were a bit concerned. My enthusiastic face must have been a bit manic. Ashley and the executive team are working right now on messaging, and I don't want to spoil anything, but our new mission is quite high up there ha. Huh? I'm fucking hilarious. I started walking around the room. So as Vought will rise up from its ashes, so must we. I paused. We must become the superhero team that we were always meant to be. That the world needs us to be. I said with enthusiasm in my voice. I stopped on the opposite side of the table where the V opened up to face all of them. They were looking at me with mixed expressions. Mostly distrust and disgust coming from Starlight and Meve. That means there will be changes not only to how we operate, but how all of Vought's heroes operate. Oh really? What are we going to go around kissing more babies? More talk shows? Sell more action figures? Meve interrupted. I stared at her for a moment, then gave her the patented cold Homelander smile. Oh there will be quite a bit of PR stunts and baby kissing, but I was thinking of something a bit bigger and more serious. I replied and continued my walk. I'm not happy with how our heroes are performing. They are the face of this company, and too many of them have their heads up their asses. I paused. Over-policing, not providing first aid, under-patrolling focusing on the wrong type of crime. Take someone let's say like Blue Hawk. That got a train's attention. How many situations could have been resolved without violence if he had just de-escalated instead? How many lawsuits would bought it avoided? Sure he appeals to a certain demographic I said whimsically with a smile, but it's really his attitude that is the problem. He's a bit too sure, too expressive in his misinformed opinions. That needs to change. I said firmly. So what, you want us to believe you suddenly care about the well-being of underprivileged communities? Starlight commented ruefully. Do it. My smile puckered with my lips and my head twitched sideways. I had to fight the urge to rip he costume off and spank her for insubordination. Yes. I replied simply. 
Time are changing and so must we. Change must come from the top and to enact change we must become that change. I said spinning some old corporate bullshit execs usually say to make the troops feel good. And I am serious about change. We will bring in every single hero to reevaluate their training, their skills, their methods and their psychological profile so that they will be better matched to the appropriate communities to safeguard. I continued. That actually took them by surprise, though I still saw doubt in all their eyes. Starlight I got her attention. This is your time to shine. As co-captain of the team I want you to lead this retraining program. She shifted in her seat and furrowed her brows, I swear, she seemed to perk up, her heart rate increasing. First aid, de-escalation techniques, community outreach, press training, performance evaluations really, anything you need to ensure our heroes are better equipped to serve their communities. You will have free reign to use whatever resources you need. Ashley already knows about this. I said and paused by the window. You're really serious about this? She asked unsure. I had everyone's rapt attention now. I am. A train will provide you support. I said turning my head to him. Me even Black Noir, I want you to lead the combat evaluation and training. Why? Me asked. They all went through combat training once. True, they did. But most have only dealt with unpowered civilians. Times are changing there are more rogue heroes, super villains if you will. I replied calmly looking out the window. You too will play a special part of this program. I let the tension build for a moment as they absorbed my words, waiting for me to elaborate. A lot of our heroes will not like the new changes, they are set in their ways, they have an attitude that needs correcting. Oh many of them will pledge their allegiance to our new way in flowery words, only to fall back into their old habits the moment we look away. I suddenly turned back to them, hands behind my back, my smile gone. I want you two to break anyone that you feel is not genuine in their efforts or their promises. I said coldly. And I don't mean figuratively I mean literally. Any whiff of treason, laziness of empty platitudes, I surprised myself with how aggressive my tone became accentuating each word, the echoes rage fueling them, bones, arms, legs, spines, you will do what is necessary to take them off the board and, if training accidents were to happen then, so be it, I finished my tone low and cold. The soups need to understand they now answer to a new supreme authority. I said with more fire than intended, a familiar surge of energy pooling inside of me. I will not have insurgency, insubordination in my house. As I looked at the team I could tell they were scared, I could not only see it, but also smell it on them and for good reason. My eyes had started glowing, and it was only when I pushed the energy down and felt the pull of gravity that I realized I had also raised myself above the floor. Homelander Homelander. Did you hear me? Annie asked. I raised my left finger in a motion to shush her as I was concentrating on the television. After a moment I released it. Sorry, what? I pretended not to have heard her. I said we need to handle this. Now. She reiterated. Uh, yeah, of course we do. Okay. So, book slots are on all the Sunday shows. Or maybe a press conference will be better. I posed to Ashley. Or both. We'll have to communicate that we have everything under control. That's smart. So smart. Ashley and her mini me reiterated. So, we're gonna Jesus, I meant that we need to stop this guy. Starlight yelled. I instantly felt myself snapping. Punish her. Quiet echo. Watch your tone darling. I said ignoring the urge to bend her over my knee and spank her for insubordination. I'm sorry, I just mean don't you think that maybe the best way to handle this is to find him. I gave her a cold smile. Oh, what a bright idea. Obviously. My tone dripping with sarcasm. But tell me, darling, let's say we get the team together and we all go and find him. Then what? I asked rhetorically. I didn't give her a chance to respond. Do we have a big old fight in the middle of the city? This is an unknown super who is obviously not in control of his powers. We have no idea what he is capable of, but considering he just toppled a city block, then we can assume he is very powerful. If we approach this the wrong way we could be endangering hundreds, if not thousands of people. So yes Annie we will find him, but we need a plan first. And more importantly we need to communicate that plan with the public to ensure they are not put into further danger, and that is why Ashley will be booking media time for us. I told her firmly. 
Yup, she was taken back. She didn't think I had put any thought into this. In the meantime you will go and ask crime analytics to collaborate with police on finding the super, and then you round up the team and come back here. I will talk with the chief of police and get the department's cooperation. I paused for a split second. I will ask that officers report on the location, but to not approach the suspect. I don't want any of them to trigger him and cause another explosion. It will be the same messaging for all of our heroes in the field and the public as well. We won't approach him until we have a plan to neutralize him or get him out of the city. Got it? She continued looking at me shocked, and I held her gaze raising my eyebrows in question. Right, that actually makes sense. She finally said. Brilliant. Very excellent. The Ashleys echoed. Then what are you all standing around for? Go. We don't have time to waste. As they turned to leave I couldn't help myself and peeked, g-string all three of them. Nice. I had my call with the police chief, and I assured him we were on it, and he assured me he'll give the orders for the officers not to approach. The police rank and file fucking loved Homelander, especially after he dipped his toes into the alt-right with Stormfront. It took about 30 minutes for the team to file in, well most of it. A-Train was doing his apology conference with Blue Hawk, while Deep was so, small setback. Starlight said as she sat next to me. It was me, her me even more at the table. The crime analytics department is out for the day. Now that caught me by surprise. What do you mean it's out for the day? I asked incredulously. Apparently, Deep, as the new head of California, gave them the day off to have a social, so he could get to know his team better. Starlight said with only a small hint as incredulity. You made Deep head of crime analytics. He's a fucking moron. Meave yelled. I rubbed my temples in frustration. Well at least I can't say that the guy wasn't trying. Nominal head. I replied frustrated. Oh, don't look at me like that. He needed a way to get back in the good graces of the company, and the department has been complaining they don't have a direct line to the heroes, to us. I paused. I thought it would be the place where he could do the least amount of damage, maybe even learn something. Besides, Barbara is still in charge of ops, and with a very hefty raise I might add. Meave made to protest, but I cut her off. Never mind that. Did you manage to contact any of them to come back? I asked Starlight. Yee we got a hold of Barbara, she was home, she managed to reach a few of the analysts, so at least some should be coming back but, and she hesitated. Just spit it out already. Apparently they are pretty drunk. I couldn't help but roll my eyes. Fucking deep. Well drunk analysts are better than no analysts. I finally said. Let's focus on what we can control for now. We have a powerful unknown super who is not in full control of his abilities. What makes you say that? How do you know? Me asked intrigued for the first time. High body language. I replied. From the footage he looked like he was having a panic attack, like he was in pain. I don't think he meant to do what he did, but that doesn't change that he is unstable, dangerous and powerful. We don't know the full scope of his abilities, how sturdy or how impervious he is to attack. Subduing him from far away is a risk we trigger his powers, from up close it's the same risk. While he is within city limits, we have to be very careful how we approach him not only for our safety, but for the public at large. We want to minimize any potential damage. Meave was looking at me like I had grown two heads. Understandable, I didn't sound like the homelander she knew. I continued. The police have already agreed to only report and not approach the suspect. Ashley's team is working on getting the same message to the rest of our heroes in the field. I looked at Meave and Black Noir. This will be a good test to see who can follow instructions and who will need retraining. Noir nodded. Okay, and what is your grand plan to stop him? Meave asked and they all looked at me expectantly. Well once we locate him I think, especially if he is in the city, that either you or Starlight approach him. If I or the other guys do it he might see us as threats and trigger his power. I replied. You will try to de-escalate, see if you can convince him to turn himself in, so we can help him and all that jazz. In the meantime the rest of the team will create a perimeter and calmly try to evacuate people, I will observe from a vantage point in the air. If I see that his power gets triggered I will swoop in grab him and fly him up and out over the ocean as fast as I can. Hopefully he is not strong enough to resist me, and we avoid any damage. Crickets. That could actually work. 
Annie looked at me mouth half open in shock. Yes, Starlight an actual plan, it's like Homelander has been specifically trained for this his whole life to be fair, Homelander stopped caring about making plans long ago. He would usually fly and smash things up and let Vought clean up his mess for the most part. He did really well in the very public situations. But if it doesn't. I said getting their attention again. 8 Rain is our best bet after me. Along with Deep. Now they thought I was stupid for sure. 8 Rain they could understand, but Deep was practically useless most of the time. So I elaborated. In the worst case scenario where I'm incapacitated a train will have to grab him at top speed and chuck him in the ocean. Deep will then drag him to the bottom. Hopefully he will either drown or be incapacitated indefinitely. It will at least buy us more time to think of our next move. I looked at them as they let my plan sink in. But none of that matters if we can't find him. So in the meantime Starlight you work on getting a hold of Deep, a train and the California team. Me you work with Ashley to get our messaging to the rest of the heroes in the field. They will listen to you, they respect you. I said firmly. Noir, you go to it and see if you can get some in-ear portable radios. We will need to shore up our communication in the field. Don't want any mishaps because we couldn't talk to each other. He nodded. I have a few media spots where I will reassure the public that we do know what we are doing and that they should take caution if they encounter the suspect. Now any questions? There were no questions. Noir didn't talk as a general rule because of his injuries, while Starlight and Meave were still too shocked by my sudden leadership and competence to question me. Good then dismissed. I finished firmly and made to leave the room. Makeup needed me there in 10 minutes. How great a threat is America facing? America, Cameron? I gave him an eyebrows raised smile like he was just telling a joke to an old friend. Don't tell me you've been having lunch with the CNN boys now have you? I said leaning in playfully. Plotting, trying to make Americans scared of their shadows? I finished by making a fake scared face with trembling fingers. Cameron skillfully played along and looked fake hurt for a moment. Ha. They'd rather eat dirt than have me at their table, but considering they're vegan well he said nodding the obvious to the camera. He smirked, I laughed, the audience laughed, even the camera guy laughed. Look Cameron I said turning serious. To call this guy a supervillain is sensationalist, click but it's the media trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. Anyone with two eyes and a brain could see from the video that this guy was disoriented and toppled over in pain before he literally exploded. This isn't some mastermind supervillain or some terrorist, this is a man in pain that is not in control of his powers, he obviously needs help. The man is probably in hiding because he is scared of what he did. I said and paused briefly then turned directly to the camera. Now this does not mean that he is not dangerous. A lot of people have died in this incident and we can't let that happen again. Everyone at home should take caution and if they see anyone matching the description, please report it to your local police station or to Vought 1-800-TIPS number. We are in full collaboration with our brave officers to safely bring in this individual in and determine exactly what went on. I turned back to Cameron. The Stormchasers, Stormfront supporters, said on 4chan that this whole thing was an attempt by Stan Edgar to discredit you. Cameron pushed on. I chuckled a bit. Right. Yay. Well, look, I I don't know anything about Stormchasers, but, uh, look, I can understand why they might think that. The minute we free Vought of the corruption and the lies, the moment we try to take the company in a new direction to help people I pause for a split second, and trust me when I say the new direction of the company will help not only Americans but all mankind. Now I'm not going to say anything now since the team is working tirelessly on it. I made a motion to continue, but Cameron interrupted. I'll get the exclusive interview? He playfully asked. Is there anyone else I could trust to tell the truth? I said motioning the obvious. You heard it folks. VNN exclusive only here you will find out how Vought will change the world. Cameron said to the camera then turned back to me. Like I said Cameron the moment we try to do good. This happens. Smells like a false flag. He said in his questioning tone. Well, you said it, pal, not me. I replied not fully denying it. And what do you say to the mayor who wants to, uh, impose a citywide curfew until the terrorists are captured? I rolled my eyes in a very obvious way. Oh please, they would have us be afraid of our own shadows. Since when have we become such an Annie state? 
I turn towards the camera. This isn't some mastermind supervillain out to get you. Is this individual be dangerous? Obviously. We are all red-blooded Americans here. I trust you all to use your common sense, the politicians may not but I do. If you see someone matching the description report it, don't approach them. If you feel like you are in danger then leave the area calmly. In case of an emergency follow the instructions of our officers and heroes. If someone needs help, help them if it's safe to do so or call for help. Look this is common stuff. Go live your lives, go about your day, have fun. Don't give in to cowardice, don't let them scare you. If you're scared you can be controlled, and that's what most of these politicians and media outlets want. I said finishing my speech. Our interview lasted a few more minutes of banter where we more or less made fun of the liberal elite. Though there was some shitting on Fox News as well. Fox was more of a mixed bag in this universe since VNN existed here. They did pretty well in covering non-soup topics. They put the fear of God into poor white Americans, that liberal gay vegan immigrants were going to come and suck the Jesus right out their children, by licking their buttholes. Between VNN and Fox, America was never going to get universal healthcare. But hey they loved Homelander and I needed my power base. I had a very important meeting with a very important man that I needed to get on my side. This man was Martin Schultz, chief science officer of Vought. He was Vogelbaum's successor not only in title but in brains as well. In short he was a brilliant man, a loyal company man. Martin, thank you for coming up. I asked him to come in the penthouse. It was by far the most secure place I could think of. Homelander didn't like to be monitored he regularly checked for devices with his enhanced senses, though considering how advanced technology was getting, I don't think I could ever be sure no one was listening in. Still this was by far the safest choice for a private conversation. Not like I could pop in the local coffee shop. John, he said in acknowledgement. How could I not when you called? I beckoned him to sit on the couch. Coffee, tea? I asked and made to go to the kitchen. No thank you. I just want to get this over with. If you're going to fire me then say it and let it be done. That surprised me. Martin, what the hell are you talking about? What gave you that idea? Stan's gone, Stillwell's gone, half the board is gone, and Ashley told the remaining exec team about your space ventures. I assume you're going to need our budget for that, for acquisitions and such. You're going to keep a skeletal team. It's obvious, out with the old and in with the new. He said reluctantly. Well he wasn't completely wrong. We did have a fairly new board, it hadn't been just Stan that got accused most of the board came down with him and a few of the Vaught execs. But he was completely wrong about why I called for him here. Martin the first would never do that to you. I said in hell, I almost meant it. Homelander's emotions were surging up again. You see Martin Schultz was now the closest thing Homelander had to a not a father, but more like a distant uncle. At the bright age of almost 20 a very brilliant young man who had already completed his PhD in biology and genetics joined Vought, quickly becoming the protege of one Jonah Vogelbaum. Martin, now in his 60s, was one of the few people that were left from the team that experimented on and practically made Homelander. Ashley told you only half the story. Yes the space ventures are going to be important, but we will also plow money back into R&D, optimizing ops and more importantly our talent. If anything your budget will increase. He looked at me unblinking for a moment trying to determine my intentions. You're serious aren't you? I am. About everything. Space, investing in our people, helping mankind. New company, new heroes. I said as heartfelt as possible. I really needed him on my side. There were only so many V experts out there. It's not like Vought let any run of the mill scientists touch their magic juice. I can't help but ask why? You've never showed any care or interest for well this? His hands gestured at Vought Tower itself, the symbol of the company. Legacy I said firmly. I am the strongest man in the world literally and now at the head of Vought figuratively as well. This is a different kind of power. A power that can truly enact change, a power that can build, a power that can help mankind. The moment I helped remove Stan I saw myself in him. I continued my little heartfelt speech. You know the skeletons of this company better than anyone. I'm not naive to believe that it couldn't happen to me. So that night I asked myself, what will Stan be remembered for? Record profits for shareholders? 
cleaning up after a bunch of rowdy soups, corruption and scandals? He was at the helm of this company for decades, and what did he do with that power? I paused. In a decade his name won't be remembered. Even I will eventually be pushed to be back of people's minds when a younger better me takes my place. I said wistfully. So that's why you're aiming for the stars? Exactly. And that's why your work, your team will now be more important than ever. That confused him. How? We're not in aerospace? I gave him a wicked smile. Martin, from a biological point of view what is the one thing that affects humans when they spend long periods of time in space? He thought for a moment then his eyes widened, dots connecting, gears spinning eureka. The lack of gravity. Muscle and bone atrophy, calcium seeping in the blood, fluid shifts, heart problems, you want V, don't you? You want V to fix these. Bingo. V gives people permanent superpowers when it doesn't kill them. 24 volt does it for a short term period, but what if we didn't want to give people superpowers? What if we wanted something weaker? Something that will simply help folks maintain, regulate or just slightly enhance. Not everyone should have superpowers, not on a space station, a small accident could kill everyone. I said faking concern. He took a moment to think, features furrowed in concentration. The company has always been focused on creating stronger, faster specimens, using V to draw out as much potential as possible, we have barely explored unlocking powers in small increments. But that's also for good reason. Vought's research indicated better results with shock doses of V. The compound has changed since Vought's time right? There's been improvements, new discoveries, new technology, new understanding of genetics. I mean 24 volt is proof of that. I know Stan would not have bet on 24 volt if he wasn't sure you were able to crack the code. He stood up and started pacing around my spacious living room. You're right we're close. And this idea of yours could work. He seemed fired up now. We could even go further than that. We could use V to express certain traits adapt people to different environments. They won't have to be super they just need to breath less oxygen or create oxygen to feed their cells using other compounds. We could colonize the planets. He said excitedly. Martin, one step at a time. First low in microgravity, space station and moon, it will be long time before we can get to Mars of Venus. Right. Of course. He said and sat back down. I'll need samples, many samples, all soups get an enhanced body to support their powers, ideally from someone with more regenerative capabilities. Oh I think I have just the right person in mind. I said with a smile. We talked for another two hours, the man left fired up with a purpose renewed. He almost looked ten years younger. I walked in the seven meeting room to me watching the replay of my and Cameron's interview. You think it really was Edgar and the mayor? Maybe Jake Tapper? Trying to FCK with me? Make me look ridiculous? I asked her. She turned to me and turned off the TV. Or maybe you're just a paranoid, malignant narcissist who thinks everything is about you. She responded with a fake smile. I could sense the slight disgust in her tone. MM, it's not paranoia if they're really out to get you, though. And you, Meve. You're out to get me, aren't you? Her smile gently extinguished. She stood from her chair and walked to me her body automatically denying the accusation with her posture. What are you talking about? William Butcher. I responded tensely. I can smell him all over you. You really will do anything to hurt me, won't you? I continued. She just gave me the I can't believe you're asking me that look. So, what are you and William cooking up? Maybe you two brought that supervilla into town? She automatically fake chuckled like I was crazy. Oh John. She started, her frame getting closer to mine. John, come one. You're talking crazy. I'm not cooking anything up with Butcher she chuckled softly. I could smell her strongly now, aside from Butcher's feigned residue, a tiny amount of adrenaline released, an inkling of sweat readying in the pores, fear. Let's talk about this. She finished softly. Liar. The scream almost made me twitch. I felt the betrayal physically. Homelander still had conflicting feelings for Meve. The urge to punish her to make her mine again physically was almost overwhelming. She's ours. Take her. I know Echo, I know but calm your shit down. I'm the one in charge so fuck off. Saner heads prevailed. I let out a deep sigh. I'm sorry. You're right. That took her by surprise. 
I walked away from her proximity lest the urges come again. You're sorry and I'm right? She asked incredulously. First you want to clean house on the heroes, giving Starlight go ahead on recruiting and training, not to mention this new mysterious direction you want to take the company on, what is going on, now you think everyone's out to get you? She asked with exasperation in her tone. Then you're acting like yourself with Cameron. It's like you're a different person from one moment to the next. Like, what, what is going on with you? Talk to me. I strongly resisted the urge to smile. She almost sounded concerned, but that was more likely due to me being more unpredictable in the last few days. Homelander was scary but fairly predictable. He wanted to be loved and hated being questioned. But his plans and schemes for the most part were fairly simple, effective but simple. One track type of thinking. He wanted Vought to be his to take the shackles of Edgar off and to make it back into a superhero company so he could be loved for being the greatest hero ever. Simple to follow, simple to understand. I don't know. I guess this whole taking over Vought thing isn't what I thought it would be. I say solemnly. Everyone's looking at me for everything. Things I hadn't even considered, the auditors want to talk to me something about the Vaughtland revenue recognition and setting up a new internal control committee. I said incredulously and shook my head. I started pacing around a bit faster. Meeting after meeting, email after email, it's just non-fucking stop. Can't everyone just do their fucking jobs? I practically shouted. And now this, this, supervillain, the fucking media won't let up on it. I stopped and turned back to her. Look I'm sorry. I think I'm just feeling cooped up. All I've done the past two days is just be in meetings. I said exasperatedly. I raised my hands over my head and subtly started stretching as if I'd been a desk monkey for the last 20 years. Yay, well not sure what you were expecting? What did you think Stan and Ashley did all day? It's all the boring paperwork we never wanted to do. I just gave her the patented Homelander look. I thought the lackeys would take care of most of it besides, Vaught is almost 100% paperless it's all about digital signing. Got it boomer? I said jokingly. Funny. Her response is sharp, but snarky toned. Can you do me a favor? I ask changing tones and make my way towards her. She looks at me expectantly. I have about an hour and 15. Do you want to get a quick spar in? I ask hopefully. She looks at me like I got hit in the head with a nuke. A spar? Me and you? She pauses. Yay a spar. I repeat. We haven't sparred in like a decade and a half? You don't spar. She affirmed strongly. I roll my eyes at her. Yes, yes, I know. But look, unless that supervillain I said using air quotes comes out and blows another taco place or something I'm not going to get out of the office until I fake looked at my hand for a non-existent watch next Tuesday. She scowls at me. I know she's trying to think what my plan is so I push forward. Meve, I'm losing my mind here. I need to get some movement in or else I might just laser in half the next person that asks me if I've read their email. Come, one. Noir is busy so you're the only one that can reasonably take a punch. Unless you want me to go break a bunch of interns in half, them and fucking it. I said only half jokingly. She stared at me intently. Fine. I let a wide smile reach my ears. Excellent, meet me in the training room in 15. I said and quickly shuffled out the door. A spar? A fucking spar? She couldn't help but think. He's up to something? But what? Something was wrong with Homelander. Something was wrong with Homeland more wrong than the wrong that was Homelander, and it made her uneasy. Homelander had always been unpredictable. Kind of she thought. When you were around him you just weren't sure when he would react with violence, especially if you were in private. But the last two days have been weird. The new initiative, giving Starlight free hand on the heroes, him taking seriously the Vought office work, his actual plan for Soldier Boy, held the only thing she could understand, was him wanting to break the other heroes. That made sense. That was classic Homelander, he didn't give a shit about anyone, and he hated to be questioned. Does he know about Butcher and Soldier Boy? She asked herself. No, if he did he would have pushed the conversation on it. The knot of anxiety in her chest was growing. He was up to something and she needed to find out. She hated how he had controlled her for what he did to her to everyone. She couldn't help but spite him, so she took her time getting to the training room. 
When she got there she was surprised to find him Homelander there, topples, in a stance, punching the air and dodging imaginary strikes. But even more surprising was his new accessory. Are you wearing a pink hair bandana? She asked mockingly making a reference to the plastic accessory holding his hair back. Ha, ha. Come on get it out of your system. He said. It's Ashley's the mini-me. I'm almost out of hair product, didn't want to waste it on this. Now, need to warm up? He said as he stood relaxed, chest out in front of her. Meve just chuckled and shook her head. Sure how about you punch me as hard as you can to start off? I won't fight back. Meve just looked at him. You're joking right? She asked not believing him. What are you playing at? She thought. Come on. I know you want to punch me. After everything I've done. For Elena? I know you want to. He said sheepishly. That triggered a rage. What's your fucking problem? What is this some fucked up way to try to absolve you? She asked angrily. Whatever game he was playing she was not going to let him get to her. Oh please. He said dismissively. You think I can't feel the tension between us? There's something up your ass as much as there is mine. So let's have it, punch me as strong as you can. I know you want to. I won't lock I won't fight back. Then we can have an actual spar. He said and put his hands up and surrender. Come one time's ticking here. I have a meeting after this to prepare for the meeting after the next meeting. Homelander said his tone oozing with exasperation. Fine if this is what he wants she will make him regret it she thought. She grounded his stance, twisted the hips and launched a straight right connecting right with his perfect nose. The strength of her punch launched Homelander of his feet bouncing him on the floor. That did make me feel better she's been wanting to do that forever. A-H-H, fuck. That hurt like a motherfucker. She heard him say as he got up. His hands checking his nose and face. Am I bleeding? He asked her. He wasn't. No of course not. He answered his own question. Still that fucking hurt. He said scrunching his face. Now you got that out of your system? Can we have a spar? He asked. Well if you want to continue, staying to course. I can do this all day. She said with a smirk. Cute. But no. He dropped into a boxing stance. She did as well. Meave saw Homelander take the initiative throwing right jabs. She dodged and jabbed left in response. Was he always southpaw? She couldn't help but think. He wasn't was he? Her thoughts were broke as she blocked a left roundhouse kick to her head. She launched her right leg up only to have his hand block it. She saw her opportunity as he leaned in to block and hit a straight left, only his right hand moved up faster, blocking her punch upwards and throwing her balance off. She saw him step in her guard, she couldn't dodge. His left hand, open palm, made contact right above her stomach. Thud. She hit the floor hard, gasping for breath. Are you alright? That shouldn't have been that hard. His tone disappointed. She took his hand and lifted herself back up. I'm fine. Again. He commanded. Meve felt herself fall back in a stance. Homelander did the same. They started much as before, jabs to test the distance and reaction. Roundhouse kicks blocked and returned in kind. She stepped and jabbed with her left the followed with a straight right hitting his guard. She felt him absorb her punch, then saw him weave to the right almost waist level and spring out with a hook at her midsection. Her quick reflexes allowed her to crunch and block. She felt herself rattle from the strength. Since when does he fight so technical? He allowed her a second to recover, then burst back in action like a lion on the hunt. They circled each other exchanging kicks and blows, feints and trap, the exchange continued. She was him sport a wicked grin and increased his speed. Caught up in the dance she matched, adrenaline fueling her movements, sheen of sweat building. Their movements now bordered on blurry. She didn't think she just acted. To think was to make a mistake. She hadn't pushed herself like this in years. Since the last time that was a mistake. The stray thought was all it took. A mistake. In slow motion, unable to react to his speed, she saw Homelander step in her guard again. His powerful left hit her above the stomach the same spot as the first time. She felt his punch burrow into her, lifting her off the ground. As her insides crunched and eyes bulged in pain, she only barely registered the right hook speeding at her head. As she hit the mat and darkness took her she vaguely heard through fuzzy vision. Medic team now. Everything is prepared? 
I asked Schultz as I watched the medic team take the unconscious Meave away. It is. Good, I need her out for about three days, maybe four if you can stretch it. The broken ribs and plexus should take about a day right? He nodded. Shouldn't be a problem. We'll have to keep her in to scan her head just in case. That hit looked pretty bad. I shrugged. It's been a while since I sparred. I said. He just raised an eyebrow but didn't say anything. We shortly went our separate ways. He had work to do. Meave may never let me near her fiery muff again willingly, but that will not stop me from saving her previous eggs. I agreed with Homelander she was too precious to simply let waste. Later that evening, after a god-awful long-ass day full of meeting, because unlike Homelander, I did want to actually know what the fuck was going on in Vought, I was half a mile up in the air watching Soldier Boy blow up the Crimson Countess. You weren't supposed to be here I had Huey say. 15 seconds, no, 12 seconds. I had 12 seconds before Soldier Boy could fire up his soup death ray. So no more secrets, huh? I heard Annie reply. Huey please don't go. Her trembling voice and higher heartbeat were clear as day to me. Betrayal, deep into her core. A fissure into her heart. You fucked up Huey. I'm going to take this tiny crack and rip it wide open. I was in the 7 meeting room going over different radio equipment Noir had brought that we could use in the field. I got to love the guy he was very efficient, unlike the other dipshit heroes. Useless. Of course they are Echo, of course they are. Noir couldn't talk, but he brought a little package with information on each of the different equipment. Though while I appreciate his effort he should have just brought the a team it would have gone faster. The doors open and deep, Ashley and a brown guy holding a laptop burst in. Homelander John they stop and steal a quick glance at each other. We have a problem. Deep takes the lead. A big problem. Ashley said scared. I give them the patented look of you fucked up. That stops them in their tracks. Okay what is it? Deep motions for the brown guy to step forward. This is Raj from Crime Analytics. Go ahead show him. Raj sets the laptop in front of me. I found this from one of the old cameras set up around chimp country. It was local only so I had to go get the data in person. He started talking. I think it's the guy you're looking for. The video showed me Soldier Boy briefly then a fragment of the aftermath of the explosion which killed Crimson Countess. We think it's Soldier Boy. Ashley said. I looked at her then deep. No, that's impossible. He died like 40 years ago. He retorted. Someone's cosplaying? Look at his face. It's him. She said exasperated. Or maybe it's CGI. Deep replied. It's a fucking monkey cam, it's not CGI. You don't even know what CGI stands for. I stopped Deep before he could reply and get things out of hand. Enough you too. I turned to the technical expert. Raj could this be CGI? Being put on the spot the man handled it pretty well. Sure, technically, but like I said this was an old style camera with a brick hard drive and a forgotten security desk. It's highly unlikely. I nodded at him. Okay so it's unlikely that it's CGI. So Raj interrupted and I felt a twitch of annoyance. But he started and we all turned to him. It could be someone cosplaying. Now we all looked at him like he was dumb. Don't look at me like that. Look, Asian guys look alike, brown guys look alike. I get it. He said using air quotations. But so do white guys. I mean look at him. He's what, a muscled up, square jawed white guy with dark hair and a beard? You take any of the bachelors from the last 20 seasons put them in the suit and they'll look like that. Wow. Shots fired. Someone is salty about the the bachelor choices of, well, bachelors. We all just stare, plus it doesn't make sense, soldier boy never had that death ray power. He said finally. Okay. That weirdly made sense. I finally said. So we need to verify first. I don't want to go on the news and tell America that Soldier Boy is back from the dead after 40 years and he is terrorizing Midtown. It will make us look like morons if it's not true. Raj, have you shown this to anyone else? No. Came straight to Deep the moment I got it. Hot damn. Deep socializing with California is paying dividends. I was already prepared to oust Soldier Boy, but this is definitely a plus. And is the laptop the only copy there is? Yes, well no, there's the USB at my desk as well. Okay. 
I'm classifying this as a company secret for now. Can I count on you to not share this until we have verified it's actually Soldier Boy? Yes of course sir. He said proudly. People love to be included in secret shit. Excellent and call me John. You and Deep will work together closely to follow up on any other leads, any videos, any images. Got it? They nodded. What do we do if it's actually Soldier Boy? Ashley asked. Nothing. I replied sharply. Same plans as before. We tell the public the truth and we try to capture him. But we need information first. How did he survive? What has he been doing? Has the government covered this up? Has Vought covered this up? So Ashley I want you to dig up anything we might have on Soldier Boy anything at all. She nodded as well. We also need to know why the hell, if it's him, he just killed Crimson Countess and a bunch of chimps. They all looked at me, like what bruh? It said chimp country I assume there's a bunch of chimps there? Okay, never mind that. Noir any insight? He's your old team leader. He didn't move. Okay good point. Go dig up whatever old files you have on him as well. I want to know everything. Now move it folks. I finished and I ushered them out of the office. I had to prepare for a very eventful day. So, you think that soldier boy is going after the rest of payback? Annie asked M.M., Countess wasn't strong enough to FCK him over on her own. She had help. Soldier boy is just getting started. He affirmed in his gruff tone. Do you know where any of them are? She asked. Those shady ass TNT twins got an address in Vermont. Okay. Does Butcher have it? No, but he'll get it. M.M. replied and picked up another gun to inspect. I think Soldier Boy is bulletproof. She remarked. This ain't for Soldier Boy. M.M. said with snark in his tone. Look, I'm pissed at those guys, too, but we have to keep our heads on. Annie begged. Why? Why do I always have to take the high road? You know, when white folks get mad, y'all mth 5 rfck 5 rs go berserk, but I got to turn the other cheek? FCK the high road, FCK butcher, and FCK Huey. He said clearly upset. Huey is not himself right now. She said coming to his defense. Huey is a grown ass man that's made his own choices. MM. Please? Soldier boy is gonna kill more people. I mean, FCK. Kamiko is in the hospital. She lost her powers. Frenchie isn't answering, Alex is dead, and Meeve's in a medically induced coma. Homelander conquest her and broke every rib in her body. M.M. looked at her questioningly. Annie sighed. They said it was a training accident. And you believe them? Of course not. But her injuries are real. I saw them myself. Her whole side of the head was bruised and swollen. Huh, so he finally snapped at her. He replied coldly. I'm surprised he didn't just kill her. Is the cover-up gonna hold? Annie didn't say anything for a moment. M.M. saw her fall deep in thought. Annie? She looked at him. That's the thing. It was really weird. They didn't threaten me, didn't block access to let me see her Ashley even showed me the video when I challenged her on it. It looked like they were actually training. Training? He asked skeptically. Yay, they were sparring. It didn't really look like a beat down, no flying, no laser eyes. It was kind of like a weird but beautiful dance, right before, well, he ends it they were moving so fast they started to blur. So, maybe he just used training as an excuse to beat her up. She's too high profile to simply get rid of. Yay, but then why go through the trouble of actually sparring? They could have just light and blocked access to Meeve but that's not all. She continued what? What is it? M.M. asked curious. I can't exactly place it how, but, Homelander's changed. Something's wrong with him. M.M. just raised his eyebrows. Oh, you don't say? What gave you that idea? He asked sarcastically. Annie let frustration color her face and gave him a look. It's not like that. T.S.K., she started pacing around the room. Ever since he took over Vought, he's been different. Different how? He went on a big rant about how he wants to clean up all the heroes that he won't allow insubordination under his watch. She said and paused. Get this, he wants me and a train to put together a training program and evaluate everyone. He said I have free hand not only to train, but to suspend anyone that I want. He's also got the whole executive team working on some new initiative for Vought. Something super top secret. 
He even has a plan and a backup plan to deal with Soldier Boy. She continued. He does? He knows about Soldier Boy? No, not that he's Soldier Boy. His plan is for me or Meave, or I guess just me now, to approach him and get him surrender, and if that doesn't work and Soldier Boy starts glowing, he'll swoop in and flying him up to avoid casualties. She finished with air quotations. M.M. snarked at her. Convenient. Let's you take all the risk and he sits back. And what's his backup? A train grabs Soldier Boy runs him in the ocean where hopefully Deep will be able to drown him. He hopes it will throw Soldier Boy unconscious if he can't breathe. M.M. eyebrows raised in surprise. Damn, that's actually not a bad plan. It might not kill him but it could work. The man still needs to breath. And not only that, but he's involved himself deeply into Vought day-to-day stuff. From morning till night he's basically in meetings, marketing, PR, finance. It's like he's suddenly a workaholic. She said almost exasperated. M.M. put down his gun and looked at her. He's a control freak. All psychopaths are and he's the king of them. You're reading too much into it he's probably just putting up a show. You know very well that Motherficker knows how to work the PR game. She looked unsure. I don't know. Maybe you're right. But there's still something off about him. But that's why everything is up to us now. She's interrupted by her phone ringing. Shit. One sec. This is Starlight. Yay of course Ashley I'll be right there. I got to go up to the tower for a little bit. She said turning to MM now? If I don't go, they're gonna know something's up. I'll be one hour. Do I need to worry about you? M.M. shakes his head and checks his gun. Okay. I'm really glad you're here. I said as I took hold of Starlight's hand. She turned her head towards me and her eyes locked. I missed you. I whispered softly and lacing warmth in words. She did well to hide it, but I could sense her discomfort. She almost said something, but then reconsidered and turned her head back to the other empty chair. I should get an award for acting. Who's joining us? Starlight asked. They didn't tell you? The host replied. Hey there. Victoria Newman answered her question while taking a seat. Hey, lady. Starlight replied. Wow. Starlight can you be any more awkward? The interview went pretty much as expected. I held Starlight's hand the whole time, and we acted like the supporting couple that we supposedly are. The mayor can say anything she wants, but Homelander is the one working to catch the guy. She affirmed and I nodded. We're about to turn a corner here. Absolutely, we are. Thank you, honey. I chimed in. Of course, sweetheart. She replies sweetly. Oh she plays her part really good. I'll have to find a way to reward her for this. With our tongue. Images popped in my brain, and I felt flood to my lower regions. Not now echo dot 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 ah fuck it, so my junk will appear even more massive than usual. That's reassuring. The host said. But there are 19 dead and dozens wounded. Congresswoman Newman, what do you say to the Americans who are watching right now and feeling scared? Unlike the show I didn't interrupt or act aggressive to the sexy blonde hostess. Not only did I have a thing for blondes, I was also curious to see how Newman would answer. I knew from the show that she wanted Starlight's public support to further her political career. Yeah, look, it's understandable they would feel that way. This is of course a very tragic situation, and I would like to reassure everyone at home that we at FBSA are working tirelessly and collaborating fully with our police officers and our heroes to apprehend this individual. It's normal to be scared of course however like Homelander and Starlight have affirmed we can't simply shut everything down, we have to live our lives. Be cautions and report anything suspicious, we are following up on all leads, and I fully trust both Starlight and Homelander that this situation will be resolved. She continued. I have to admit, she was pretty good. The interview continued, and we mostly stuck to the talking points in reassuring the public that while they should be cautious, they should continue business as usual. As we finished the interview I couldn't help but listen into Newman and Starlight's little conversation. Controlled super hearing was fantastic. I could hear almost everything that went on in the tower if I concentrated enough. It took skill to prevent myself from being drowned out by hearing everything all at once. Luckily Homelanders had 40 years to perfect this skill. Annie just turned down Newman's team-up offer. It's admirable that she finally found her balls and plans to strike out on her own, 
However I do think America would benefit more from Newman's education reform bill. God knows the students could use smaller class sizes. Now then, I had a little Asian minx to find. I have to say Kamiko was a badass. It didn't take me long to find the warehouse they were in. Super vision and see-through vision is great, coupled with super speed I was able to cover most of the city fairly quick. Plus I was looking for a rundown warehouse which narrowed down the search quite a bit. The scene was absolutely bloody. Had I not had Homelander's memories and constitution I would have been horrified. The amount of damage Kamiko took and still stood was also outstanding. She supposedly lost her powers, but no normal human would have been able to withstand the pain, blood loss and do what she did. Not to mention she was already recovering from a pretty bad injury before. I suspected the V wasn't quite as gone as she thought from her system, either that or it the compound changed you so much that even when you weren't super anymore, you were still enhanced. Meave did survive a skyscraper fall after supposedly she lost her powers from soldier boy exploding in her face, which should have killed her in the first place. Still these were only assumptions I was making, it will be up to Martin to figure it out. This is why I was securing Kamiko. She was incredibly precious. She had Wolverine-like regenerative abilities, come back from the dead bullshit basically. It was the type of power that I wanted to get my hands on personally and of course the type of power that will help advance the evolution of mankind. Hers was an ocean, but if we could take only one cupful of that power, then maybe it will be enough to allow humans to adapt to living in space and hopefully other environments. Or so I theorized with Martin. Whether it helped true or not remains to be seen, but we would never find out without appropriate live samples. Moncur, Moncur. She's gone. Nina's gone. It's over. I heard Frenchie's trembling voice softly whisper. Cue me. Well, well, well. I've missed a hell of a party. Their eyes turned towards me in horror. You, what 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 are you doing here? Frenchie asked in his shitty accent. I feel like I should be the ones asking that question. I said skeptically pointing at them. But if you insist, I was looking for the terrorist that blew up midtown when I came across, well, this. I'm not one to kink shame, but this is a bit much. And you little lady are in terrible condition. I took out an item I had inside my suit and walked to where Kamiko was lying covered in blood on the body of a dead Russian. What are you doing? Leave her alone leave her alone. He cried. Ignoring his pitiful cries, I walked toward her bloodied body. She tried to fight me, but really she mostly just toppled over in pain. Just a few forced sprays from the bottle, and she was fully passed out. Leave her alone. Where are you taking her? He shouted desperately as I picked her up and walked to the exit. Laser him in half. I twitched as his accent really grated me. Oh would you shut the hell up. I snapped at him my eyes glowing red. I unleashed a precise laser strike which melted the lock keeping him tethered to the post. She's bleeding internally and externally very badly. It's a goddamn miracle she's even alive, no thanks to you. I said sharply. Guilt immediately filled his face. I'm taking her to Vought Tower. The medical team there knows how to deal with soups. No, no. Leave her alone. She doesn't even have powers anymore. He made to lunge towards me, and I lasered the ground in front of him. Yay we'll see about that. I mumbled. If you ever want to see her alive then listen carefully. A Vought security team and the police should be here in a few minutes. Wait for them. They will help you out. Once you give your statement to the police to clear up whatever the hell this is the Vought team will bring you to the tower. He looked at me shocked. And he could now also hear the sirens approaching. Now if no more questions I'm going to save her life. Take care of your other friend until they come. It was then that he remembered Cheery and rushed to her. I swiftly took off to the tower. Martin was waiting for me. After I had to kick Frenchie out of the tower and made him come back tomorrow for making a scene about Kamiko, the dude just could not get it through his head that we were not going to release a barely alive woman in his capable hands, plus Martin needed to collect samples, I received the call from Deep about Soldier Boy. So I was flying to Vermont while keeping an eye out for a certain quarreling naked couple. Easy to do with super vision and super hearing. I thought the drug had FCK5DU up, Huey, but this is you. This is all you. I heard Starlight say. Bingo. I rush and land with a big thud in the classic superhero pose. Startling both of them. Oh my god. 
Uh, Homelander. Shit. Starlight, honey. I say with a cold smile. Mind telling me what you are doing here, arguing, with UX in the middle of the street naked? I slowly walked over to the trunk of their car. Uh, we were just, uh, millimeters, uh, she started stuttering. Streaking, uh, camping, naked. Enjoying nature. It's not a crime. Huey muttered out. I popped open the trunk, took the clothes bag and threw it at Annie. Right, right. And it just so happens it's next to the house where Deep was following up on a lead for our midtown terrorist. Who by the way Deep swears it's soldier boy back from the dead. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that would you? I said approaching his naked self. I let my eyes turn red. Slice him. Soon echo. Soon. Uh, well. That's just a big coincidence he started trying to explain. Look Homelander we were just I turned to her. She paused looking conflicted for a moment the terrorist is actually, Annie don't. Huey says suddenly finding his balls. Enough you two. I snap at them. Whatever this is I motion my hands at them. It ends right now. I walk towards Annie. Soldier boy or not our, our suspect is supposedly on that estate over there. He is dangerous and a lot of people could die. Now you have to make a choice stay with free willy over here to come with me and prevent more deaths. I say extending my hand to her. She looks conflicted for a moment. I get it, the no-brainer move was to go and save lives which she was going to do beforehand anyway, but now the scenario changed. Homelander was asking her to go save lives with him. If she took my hand it was almost like betraying Huey. Not quite like sleeping with the enemy but close enough. She made to say something when Quaboom. We all heard the sounds of shouting, screaming and saw a red beam in the distance. A good old soldier boy having PTSD. Annie I said with as much heartfelt as I could muster. People are dying. I need your help. She took one last look at Huey and steeled her resolve. She grabbed my hand and I pulled her in close to me. No. I won't let you. Huey shouted. He took a step and tried to make a hop to teleport and catch me by surprise, but I already knew about his power. No. Annie. No. He shouted when he realized he grabbed air. We were already gone when he I saw his foot lift off the ground. We landed in front of the, it was horrifying, massive destruction, people bleeding, burning, screaming. I unclasped my cape from my shoulders and gave it to her. Here use this to bandage people up. I'm going in. He's still here. Try to get the people as far away as possible. I said and walked in. Hopefully she'll do the smart thing and stay away. I ventured deeper into the torn house, down the stair, round the corner, and instantly rage swelled up from deep within. Kill them both. Kill them now. We need a cool head to deal with this echo. I don't want to accidentally get killed by soldier boy's death beam. As much as I was playing it cool and restricting Homelander's impulses, it was a blend of his memories, ego and future knowledge that allowed me to even be in this situation. I was a fairly normal guy before. The most death and destruction that I'd seen before was on TV. This was the real deal with real danger. People were about to try to kill me. So cooler heads were needed. William Butcher and Soldier Boy. You are behind this, this whole thing really is about me. Huh, I had a big fight with Meve about it. She called me crazy. I said slyly. But it really is all about me. William, we made a deal to fight to the death, you and me. This is cheating deals off. This here is the part where Homelander would laser Butcher casually. Butcher would take it like a champ, and Homelander would be stuck fighting two opponents. I could see Butcher was tense ready for me to make a move. So I decided to throw a curveball his way. William Butcher, by the power invested in me by the United States government, I am placing you under arrest for accessory to murder, manslaughter, property destruction, terrorism. You have the right to remain silent and refuse to answer questions. Anything you say may be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to consult an attorney before speaking to the police and to have an attorney present during questioning now or in the future. I paused and took a breath as they both looked at me confused. You have the right well you get the point William. Surrender yourself peacefully and you will not be hurt. I said cheerfully. You off your rocker mate. There's only one way this ends. Well no one could say I didn't try the peaceful way. At the first sign of his eyes turning yellow I made my move. 
I ducked low and launched myself at super speed to him. His laser beam hit air. He wasn't prepared for me to go that low, nor was he prepared when I yanked him by his feet. I twisted my body to avoid smacking into the wall head first. Being prepared for it I ignored the pain, Homelander was pretty damn invulnerable, but he still felt pain, and burst through the rubble straight up carrying him with me by the ankles. I violently crashed through the upstairs floors and ceiling. The instant we were outside I spun him around gathering momentum and chucked him at super speed, hopefully halfway across the state. If he's lucky he will fall in a field and not on someone killing them. It didn't really matter in less than a second and a half he was out of the fight. By the time he lands and makes his way back this fight will be over hopefully. I flew back inside and landed a few meters away from soldier boy. Now that I've gotten rid of the rubble it's just you and me. I said taking in his appearance. Soldier boy looked relaxed and barely impressed with my super acrobatics. Tell me I started casually. Are you really soldier boy? I obviously knew he was, but I needed to play the ignorant part, you never know who might be listening. In the flesh. He responded confidently. Amazing, I have so many questions for you. We all thought you died. What happened? How did you come back from the dead? Why are you hunting your old team? Is it a sex worker thing? I couldn't help myself but ask. A little trolling never hurt anyone. That threw him off. He looked confused. Is it a sex worker thing? Are you killing them because they were sex workers? What the hell are you talking about? Crimson Countess was video calling with a client jerking off, pay for play style right before you burned her to a crisp. And this I said pointing all around me is obviously an orgy. I assume the twins were hosting a harrogasm event. So is it a sex thing? Are you trying to kill them for being gay or for their kinks? What? Buddy I invented harrogasm in 52. The Countess and the twins had to die. They betrayed me, ungrateful fucks. Is that so? So what happened how did you survive the nuclear meltdown? There was no nuclear meltdown. It was a covert op in Nicaragua, CIA black ops shit. Bot tried to get rid of me, so the team betrayed me, attacked me sold me off to the Russians. He replied and I could see he was a bit emotional about it. So what are you a Russian agent now? That seemed to trigger him. I'm not fucking traitor. He spat out angrily. I'll get to those fucks as well, but first my team then bought. I smiled. HMH, see now usually I'm a sucker for a revenge plot, and considering you were my here growing up I'm even inclined to help you, but there is just a small problem. He casually raised an eyebrow. I am Vought I said dropping the smile. And as the greatest hero in the world I can't simply let you do as you please. I'm offering you the same deal as Butcher. Surrender peacefully. He chuckled. Buddy I don't know what you think you are, but you look like a giant blue dildo. Kill him. Instant rage surged. But I have to admit that was a pretty good one. Without my cape I did kind of look like a big ass blue dildo. Violence it is. I burst into action flying straight at him, a split of a second for me to make contact, but he's already prepared. The crash into the wall is not nearly strong enough to rattle him. I fucked up I should've gone faster, harder, but even Homelander needs space to fully accelerate. I don't try to laser him like in the show I go straight for punching, but his hand is already up blocking me. His left makes contact with my cheek. Fuuuk. His right punch to my gut almost knocks the air out of me, but it also pushes me back a bit. This gives him more space for a more powerful strike, but it gives me a split of a second to recover as well. Block his incoming left and retaliate with my own right in his, almost as perfect as mine, nose. We exchange a flurry of blows half being blocked and half connecting almost as a game to see who can take more punishment. His blows hurt unlike anything I've experienced since my late teens when my powers matured. I'm supposed to be his son, the better version of him, but his blows hurt. More than that it damaged me, it fatigued me. I knew from the show he was able to actually injure me. It's the fucking radiation that he's leaking. Like kryptonite it's slowly weakening me. Whatever radiation the Russians hit him with in their experiments, Soldier Boy's V enhanced body evolved, adapted to it, and made it a strength. I hope those same genes were passed on down to me as well. That could become very useful. And while it was very impressive it also meant that I was fighting a losing battle the longer I took to knock him out. Each blow I took damaged me, while mine only rattled him. 
The closer I stood to him the weaker I became. I needed to finish this quickly. I blocked his right hook with my left and caught his left fist in my right hand. I made to punch him with my left, but he reciprocated and caught it as well. For a second we stayed locked in a contest of strength, one I was slowly winning. Ha! I'm stronger in the moment. To his further surprise I kicked straight with my left leg, sending him crashing into the wall again. Homelander's raging instincts urged me to follow after him and choke him out while he was raveled. But fuck that I'm not going to risk it. I took the few seconds of respite to calm down and gathered my energy, my eyes turning red. I needed my aim to be precise and powerful. My vision zeroed in on him like an eagle. He caught his breath and shook of whatever pain he was feeling. I know he was expecting me to rush him so curiously why I didn't his head lifted and his eyes met mine. That was it. I unleashed all the gathered energy in a powerful blast catching him straight in the eyes. A-C-H-H-H. He yelped, his hands clutching his eyes. I knew that this blinding was only temporary, but this was it, his guard was fully down. I super speeded plunging my left in his unprotected gut. He toppled over in pain. Taking a hit that you expect is one thing but a hit that you don't is a lot more damaging. Next my right, then my left. Right, left, right, left. Punch after punch I tried to rearrange his insides. My right hook plunged him into the ground, he was pretty out of it now I could tell his eyes looked disoriented. I jumped on him ground and pound style. Blow after blow I rained on his perfect cheeks. A raging fury swallowing me whole. Kill him. Kill him. I'm fucking trying Echo. I'm trying. Break god damn it fucking break already. If he was breaking I couldn't tell, he was out of it, but I hadn't drawn blood yet. If anything with each punch I felt my arms hurting, my fists going numb and not in the good way. Fucking radiation. A-A-H-H. I screamed as I tried to up the intensity of my blows. I was so into my rage that I didn't notice Huey teleporting in until I my punch hit empty ground, causing a little crater and a shockwave. Fuuuk. I looked at the forested area around me. That fucking little prick. I'm going to kill him. I flew straight up and looked around. The breeze felt cool on my skin, and it hit me that I was naked. God damn it. Luckily the house wasn't far away. I contemplated trying to find them, but realized it wouldn't do me any good. My adrenaline boosted rage was wearing off, and I was starting to feel my fatigue and injuries. Plus I'd lost momentum. Soldier boy would have recovered by now, and I didn't want to fight him and Huey at the same time. I took a few deep breaths and calmed myself. I also had to go back and deal with Starlight. I can't let her talk shit about me to America. I flew back to the house, admittedly at a leisurely pace, and landed Buck as naked right in front of Starlight and M.M., who were helping triage a bunch of barely alive folks. They were both instantly on guard and confused. Homelander? What happened? Annie asked reluctantly. I gave her a very displeased smile. I was winning, until an unknown teleporter came and whisked me away. Literally stopped me from pounding soldier boy back into the grave. Letting him go free so he can continue killing. I said spitefully. She didn't know what to say, and neither did M.M. I let out a big sigh. We can talk about it later. There are a lot of people here that need our help. I'll get dressed and we can triage who I should fly to the hospital directly, and who can wait for ambulances to show. I can hear them they are close by. For the rest of the night I worked quietly and efficiently side by side with Starlight and M.M. in helping the injured. They didn't trust me and I didn't trust them, but we had a sort of neutral ground understanding. She didn't go on insta live to talk shit about me, and I made no threats to her or M.M., nor did I try to cover up the existence of Soldier Boy in the initial police report. I think she also liked that I didn't mention Huey in it either. I wasn't going to anyway I wanted Huey to dig his own grave both figuratively and literally, after all 24 volt is very deadly. For now it was an uneasy understanding between us. With closed eyes, she felt the blanket of warmth envelope her, relaxing her muscles, while the white noise of the running water soothed her thoughts. She applied the grapefruit and guava scented body wash with practiced easy feeling its foaminess bubble up against her skin. The scent filled her lungs, reminding her of a different time when it was just her and her mother, preparing for pageant shows. A simpler time, a naive time, one she once hated but would prefer now, a time she would never be able to go back to. 
Helped by the slickness of the bubbly foam, her hands roamed all across her body, massaging and slowly washing away the stress and the literal blood that was caked on. A stark reminder that today's events were real. A dozen dead, a dozen more critically wounded, more would probably die later tonight in the hospital. People burned in horrific ways, not to mention the supposed radiation. Even if they survive their initial injuries the radiation will eat them from the inside. She shuddered for a moment and stopped, letting the shower work its soothing effects. Everything she wanted to prevent as a hero happened today. The worst was that it was all helped by Huey. Butcher she understood, he had an obsession. Hell she wanted to take down Homelander, for Alex for everyone, but at what cost? Teaming up with an out-of-control murderer? How many innocents have to die? And Huey she felt anger rising, he was supposed to be the voice of reason in their group. He lied to her, in more ways than one, and he was turning out to be as obsessive as Butcher. She tried telling herself it was the 24 volt, but it wasn't. The substance just brought out what was hidden beneath the layers of good and caring. And that was just it, the hardest part to reconcile, it wasn't him, and yet it was him more than anything else. All the powerful love, emotion and caring focused on one goal, the moment he was enabled to. Her thoughts were broken by the muffled sound of her doorbell ringing. A glimmer of hope rose into her chest, Huey it had to be him, though it was quickly subdued by anger. She quickly threw a towel on and rushed to the door. Huey, if you think, you can just come and apologize, and she started saying as she opened the door but then stopped. Oh, uh, Homelander? She asked unsure. He just raised an eyebrow. Obviously. He answered. I doubt Huey would come visit you here in Vought Tower where I live, not after today. I'm sure he's smart enough to realize that would not be a good idea. He said with a sarcastic cold smile. Uh, right, right. She shook her head getting her thoughts straight. So, why are you here? To her surprise he walked past her forcing himself in, though there wasn't much resistance as she simply moved aside as he started walking. I've been calling you but you haven't answered. I was showering. Yes I can see that. We have a press conference tomorrow and we need to get our stories straight. He said as he lifted the laptop she just now noticed he was holding. We also have to coordinate our R's. She looked confused. Ours? She saw him sigh and deflate. Ours, after action reports? We said last meeting we will introduce them after every hero intervention? To have more transparency, better support police investigations, part of the new program we are going to implement? Any of that ring a bell? Yes she said a bit annoyed. But that's not until we actually come up with a new training and evaluation program. We haven't even started on it. Well this seems like a good place to start. Homelander said. If anything deserves an R then it's today's events. And it couldn't wait until tomorrow? She felt herself be annoyed. No, it could not, and if you'd have checked your phone you'd see that Ashley scheduled us for the press conference 8 a.m. sharp, she wanted us to meet tonight, but considering today's events I pushed her off to give us some time to breath. He paused for a moment. She gets way too stressed and way too excited about things. She saw him shake his head and roll his eyes. Now that she was looking at him closer, instead of just looking at all of him, she saw two darker spots of skin, one on his right cheekbone and one on the left-hand corner of his mouth. And I've had enough excitement for today. He finished off. He was hurt. Actually hurt, soldier boy did that. Why didn't she notice it after the fight? Then again they mostly focused on the wounded. How close had soldier boy been to killing him? Did Huey and Butcher know dot 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 no. He said he was winning when Huey teleported him away. Was that a lie? Was he her thoughts were interrupted when she felt a hand grab her shoulder. Annie, are you okay? Hey, snap out of it you're zoning out on me. She frowned and automatically took a step back out of reach of the appendage. Uh, yay sorry, just, uh, he saw him looking at her to elaborate, an inkling of panic. I don't think I've ever seen you not in your costume. She ultimately blurted out. It just seems off. He was wearing a plain white t-shirt and beige slacks. He seemed taken aback by it. You know I don't wear it all the time right? You don't think I sleep in it do you? A rhetorical question though she felt his tone was serious. No, of course not. She said automatically. Yay, that didn't sound very convincing. He said dismissively and casually sat on her couch. Look it's been a long day. 
We just have to go over a few points to make sure we don't say anything we shouldn't. He paused briefly. I would prefer not to have to answer any questions as to why my very supportive girlfriend was naked in the middle of the road, arguing with her ex just by the house where our so-called suspect happened to be. He paused for a split second again and continued with a cold smile. A house that I might add was hosting an orgy. Now if you could please get dressed, because as much as I enjoyed the view earlier it is not conducive for working quite the opposite, very distracting. She felt his eyes roam up and down her body, practically touching her, and suddenly she felt very naked even with the towel on. Plus you're dripping water all over your living room. He finished. Ah shit. Fine. Give me a moment. She finally said and quickly tiptoed to her bedroom. She quickly dried off, changed and came back out, where she saw him already typing at the laptop. Okay, so what do you want to go over first? She took a seat across from him on a chair. Well, first the reason you were in the area. We can say Deep contacted you, we'll need to find a reason why you weren't in costume, which shouldn't be too hard, and as for after the explosion, we can say your clothes were damaged, and you changed in whoever you could scavenge. You might not even be asked any of these questions, but it's good to have something prepared for it just in case. She listened to him and gave her input along with ideas how to approach the whole situation, the next steps they would present and what they will be doing. Before she knew it his questions drew her in the conversation, and over an hour had passed when they realized it was midnight. Let's call it a day. He finally said closing his laptop. I think we went over most points. If it's something you're not sure just say I don't know at this time we'll have to look into it, I'll do the same it works most of the time. She felt a skip of a heartbeat and a trickle of shame, as she nodded both to his statement and to the realization that she had actively enjoyed this impromptu work session, a part of her was slightly sad to finish it. Oh, and tell Huey that whatever this little game butcher rope him in with soldier boy will only end up with him dead if he keeps playing. He's only alive because of you however my patience can only stretch so far. He said with a fake cold smile and left. Anxiety and anger swelled up within her again. The spacious bot conference room was packed to the brim, with reporters and officials, while the serious mood of the situation was betrayed by the cheery sun peeking through the edges of the see-through minimalistic blinders adorning the windows. The incessant clicking sounds of the cameras had slowed down as Homelander and Starlight answered questions about last night's events. Unsanctioned CIA operation in Nicaragua in 84. She watched Homelander answer calmly. It hadn't been easy to organize all this last minute, well technically getting the reporters here was, it was the city and state officials that were always prickly about things. Fucking assholes she thought, after all Vought was doing all the heavy lifting for them. Conspiracy between US government, Vought and the Russians as far as we know last night's events, were a giant mess for her, for Vought for the dead and wounded for everyone really. A real rogue supervillain, a Vought mistake coming to bite them in the ass, just as she finally reached the top, it wasn't fair. Cover up on a massive scale, we can only speculate on the deal with the Russians her hand twitched, but she resisted the urge to play with her hair. Homelander wouldn't like that no John, you have to call him John now, she chided herself mentally. Something was wrong with John as well, he was unnerving. Before she was afraid he could snap at any moment, crush her in his hands, and slice her in two with his eyes, but now he felt different. He wants revenge on Vought, on superheroes, on the US and Russian government, she heard Starlight answer. He was calmer, colder more methodical. He had a sudden interest in all things Vought, suddenly he'd become a workaholic when before he'd never shown any interest in Vought operations outside of the Seven. We believe he was turned into an anti-super weapon by the Russian and US governments, the scary part for her was how knowledgeable he was of actual operations in a big corporate environment. The jargon he was using the insights he was drawing and the general comfortableness he had in meetings, like he'd been doing it his whole life. We believe clandestine government involvement as he was helped by former CIA operative one William Butcher and an unknown teleporter on one hand, the company seemed revitalized. It's one thing to say you work for Vought with the Seven, and it's a completely different thing when Homelander himself attends your meetings, understands what you do and gives you practical advice. The mid-level managers and analysts were practically buzzing with excitement. We are working closely with state and local authorities to locate him due.
To the danger involved we do not recommend for any law enforcement to approach him on the other hand, the he had the executive team was running on fumes, trying to get him all the information requests. Not to mention working on his space idea. She thought it was stupid, the telecom idea might work but space, will that really work with the public and the shareholders? Probably not, she couldn't see it, but if it kept him not homicidal she would endorse it, she would work on it. If they succeeded they would reach the stars, literally, and if they failed well hopefully she wouldn't end up like Stan or worse dead. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.